as, as Ray said, yes, I did cross the ditch, um, but I'm going to take you back a little bit before that and my beginnings. Uh, I was born... I've got, got to work this first. There we go. Ah, yes. Eight years old, I think, releasing a rabbit back into the wild. Um, probably not always the, what people want to hear, but that was my first camera. So from a very young age... Oh, well, I was brought up in New Zealand, I was brought up on a farm, spent most of my time with animals, walking around in the bush. I was enormously shy, but I had this feeling always that I wanted to tell stories, but not in a way that we just view them from the outside, it was always to feel them from the inside, to experience something. And I spent uh, a good chunk of my time when I was a child finding ways not to go to school, and hang out in the bush, and hang out with the animals, and take the horse, the dog, and the cat, and just sit and watch. And I didn't realise at that stage in my life, at that young age, that I was setting myself up. My whole upbringing was setting myself up for what I would do later, and and my parenting as well. I mean, when we a bit different to today, I suppose. When we were riding horses, we were competing. If I fell off my parents would turn around and walk in the opposite direction and or tell us to get back on straight away and don't sook. So again, that was all setting me up for stuff that was going to be a lot, lot tougher later. So when I was t 16, I was doing art at school. I uh, wasn't doing photography at that time because the school didn't provide that facility or that course. But it was in New Zealand, it was your school C year, it was a big year, so I was painting using oil pastels and doing landscape pictures of, I didn't realise then, but more probably outback sort of style. And then I had a dream. I had a dream when I was 16 that I was walking beside a tall black man. We were walking up over rubbish and bits of junk and things, and, and he said to me, He's telling me about his people's problems. He's telling me all what was going on. And he said, can you, can you come and help us? Can you come and do something with us? And I said, well, yeah, I can. This is in my dream, which didn't really feel like a dream. It felt very real. But I'm only 16. Give me a few years and I'll, and I'll come. When I woke up the next morning, I felt, gee, I felt like I'd been transported somewhere. It didn't feel like a dream. And it stuck with me for about four days. And I thought, well, when I'm older, I must be going to Africa. You know, tall black man, I'll probably go to Africa. I did go to Africa, but I only went for a visit. So jumping ahead, it's 21, it's, well, no, 19, I got a job in a community newspaper in New Zealand. I lasted about nine months, and I thought it was pretty boring. I thought, if that's it, uh, I don't know if I want to do it. But on a gut feeling, I had a boyfriend, but on a gut feeling, I thought, get on a plane and come to Australia. I got on a horse plane, appropriately, arrived in Melbourne, got the bus to Sydney. My, my sister was here, so I met up with my sister. And within the first week of being in Australia, I had three photographic job offers. And one of them was uh, for Reuters. And I went in, and Will Burgess, who was the chief photographer at the time, funny enough, had photographed me when I was four years of age. And he said, we're going to photograph the Inter Dominion tonight, the horse trotting thing. He said, do you want to come along for a bit of work experience? I'm going to put you on the finish, finish line. And he said, excuse the language, but he said, don't fuck up. And I'm like, oh, shit. So I took the picture. So back in those days, obviously, we were using film, but Reuters were the first to... In the, in the media in, in Australia to start shooting with colour neg and go switching from black and white. Uh, so I got the shot, got back to the office, and we, all had dis we, sent, we put the picture out on the wire service. Mind you, I had never worked on a computer before. I'd come pretty raw straight from New Zealand. I'd been working in the community newspaper. The dark room was an old morgue, still had the curtains, still had everything in it, working with the enlarger, developing all the negs. Will, we'd sent this picture via the Phoenix machine, which separated the colours and sent it bit by bit. Um, he disappeared, then he came back and he says, 
you want a job? Do you want to work here full time? And uh, I was split in the middle. I thought, my mouth said yes, but my heart and everything said, God, where's the crack in the earth? Can I fall through it and disappear? I thought, there's no way I'm ready for this. And um, so I took the job. <laughs> so for four years, I worked for Reuters. On the first week, the Australians weren't very happy. The Australian photographers weren't happy. This is a blonde girl come from New Zealand, got the job. So on the first job, one of the first jobs, I was sent out to photograph a Chinese diplomat. So I haven't got these shots here, but these are examples of, of this time in my life. And one of the wi other wire photographers, who was in opposition, said, now, now, pulled me aside, he said, now, if you're going to photograph a press conference like this and then a, a sort of a media scrum afterwards, he said, you need to stand back with a long lens. That's how you're going to get it. And I'm thinking, a long lens. I'd be standing behind everyone else and I'll miss the picture. Don't listen to him. Get in there with a, with a wide-angle lens and get in there and get the shot. Well, of course, he was trying to trip me up. So I got the shot and I was so scared not to get the shot because my bosses at Reuters were so abusive if I didn't get anything, it wasn't worth coming back to the office. The second week, one of the other photographers from another newspaper came up to me and, well, no, she might have been a, a few couple of weeks after that. And I was thinking, oh, I'm not sure if I want to stick in this business. It's so ego-driven and it's so rough. And this photographer came up to me and he said, Tch. he said, you won't last long in this business. Women never do. And I thought, thank you very much, you person because now I'm going to stay, just to prove you wrong. <laughs> so I did. So after, and in my first, first six months at Reuters, I got front cover of Time. I got a lot of front cover pictures. My boss at the time saw this picture, saw the magazine arrived on his desk. He threw it on the floor and walked over it and kept walking and never said a word. It, it was a lot of jealousy and it was a lot of, it was tough. But on the other hand, I was working with some of the best photographers in the business. So I learned, to, I didn't learn from them directly, I learned how not to stuff up because the fear of stuffing up was worse than, worse than anything. So you photograph famous people. I mean, I don't have a lot of the images from there because they all get sent off, so you don't own the copyright. But it just gives you an idea this, I spent a week with the sumos and I was on a boat with them and I was, had a big heavy backpack on and it suddenly became light. I thought, what's going on? Sumo was behind me holding it up as I was walking around. <laughs> I thought, I wonder if I could have a pet sumo. That'd be good. <laughs> so, after four years at Reuters, I got a phone call and I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to be a conflict photographer. I'd always thought I needed to again, back to that childhood thing, be able to show things that not everyone sees. And I was very I idealistic that, you know, I wouldn't worry if I got killed as long as I, what I did would make a difference in the world. I'm probably quite naive, but I felt the strong sense of doing something that was really important. When I was at, uh, after four years at Reuters, I was, I was thinking, I'd, you know, I'll go to Africa, I'll go somewhere and do complex stuff. I still, there was a ceiling. It was a bloke's world. When I started at Reuters, I was 21. I was the youngest and only one of four women in the whole of Reuters, and Reuters have got uh, a bureau in every capital city of the world. So just when I'd got to that point in my life where I wasn't worried about the bullying, which was happening at work, and I was calm, and I thought, I can't ever leave anything if I have fear, and I'm okay in this now, and then the Australian rang up and said, do you, want a, do you want a job in Perth? I'm thinking, oh, God, Perth. Yeah, well, that's, I've spent all this time working at Reuters. I've put the hard yards and going to a newspaper is sort of a backward step. Had three days to think about it. So, again, I had a boyfriend, job, offer, job that I had here. Uh, and the Australian said, we'll pay you more money, which wasn't a hard thing to do. Um, wasn't much. Um, and my father, who's Irish and very black and white, says, what have you got to lose? So I thought, yeah, gut feeling, go, all right, leave the boyfriend, take the job. 
So I took the job and the first six months at the Australian and Perth Bureau were actually on the first day that I arrived there. I thought, oh my God, what have I done? I've come from high rise, you know, doing international stories with Reuters, came to Perth. It was a broken down old Sunday Times building with a few broken down old photographers in it. And when I walked in there, they circled me, a bunch of blokes. And uh, what are you doing here? Sort of bullying. And I sort of folded my arms. I said, is that the best you can do? I've been with the best bullies. If that's the best you can do, it's not going to work. And they kind of looked at themselves and then laughed and went, right, that was fine. But the second day, I got sent out to Kalgoorlie. And Kalgoorlie, being a mining town, and I'm still naively thinking country towns are conservative, I didn't realise that Kalgoorlie, it was the mining conference, photographed the miners during the day and all their, their diggers and dealers. That night, the bloke said, come to the pub. Came to the pub, we're going to the Fed. Lights full on, bright pub. I looked around as I walked in the door and the blokes disappeared and left me there and I looked around, there's all men here. And then at the bar was skimpies. Nothing on, just serving the men with the naked. I thought, oh shit, maybe I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> and I think I'm supposed to be here. And I thought, what do you do? Go to the bar and order a drink. And I was at the bar ordering a drink and I felt these eyes on me, directly here, right there. And, um, and the bloke says, you looking for work? I thought, I've just got a job. He says, that's a pity. He didn't take his eyes off here. He says, if you change your mind, you've got a job. I said, why well, are you the manager? He says, yeah, and you've got a job if you want one. I thought, <laughs> photography fails. I could earn a lot more money. <laughs> so that was my introduction to WA. So six, for the six, first six months, I didn't really know what Perth looked like because they had the wharf dispute then Sahato, then uh, president of, of Indonesia, had resigned and I was sent to Jakarta for the riots. And we flew on on a big plane with just the journalist and myself and nobody else on the plane. The whole thing was shut down. So we were straight into a bit of conflict. So it, it, it's, again, you just get out and you take pictures. You do whatever you need to do to get to tell the story. And it just... It, is a lot of adrenaline, but it um, just felt quite normal for me to be able to handle something like that. After I'd been in Jakarta for a couple of weeks, I got back to, the, back to Perth, and the newspaper said, um, we want to take advantage that since Jakarta's, news, that Jakarta's in, in upheaval, they're not going to be looking at East Timor, and we haven't had any media in East Timor since the Balibo Five. So we need you to get on a plane. I was down doing a naval base picture. Then I had to rush back and do a portrait of John Howard and then pretty much grab my gear and get straight on the plane. And I arrived in Dili and I was having to look like a backpacker. I had my camera gear stuffed and in, rolled into my clothes. And when I got to the airport, uh, two of the Indonesian soldiers were coming straight towards me. I thought, oh shit, what am I going to do now? And just as they'd got to me, I saw a, a white guy who was an Australian, happened to be Australian. He came rushing up and he had two nuns with him. He grabbed my bags, handed them to the nuns, put his arms around me, said, so good to see you. And he put me in the, got in the car with him and he said, so who the hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> and I explained who I was. He said, do you know how lucky you are? you know how bloody lucky you are? He said... You know, media can't be in here. You're going to be in. You could have been in serious trouble then. And that was the beginning of my two weeks. It was one thing after another, and um, had had bullets flying over their head. And the Indonesian soldiers had shot dead a young East Timorese man in the back. And the students. He was a student, and they had decided that because of all the upheaval in Jakarta, that they would start making a scene there because they, there was a, a, f a couple of other media there who had come in. There was Dutch and uh, um, some other, I think, uh, uh, a TV, ABC TV crew. So when they, the Indonesians had shot this young fellow, they had, the, the students had got him and they had dragged his body, taken his body around the streets in protest uh, and they'd brought him to a hotel room. The next day, we went to the family's room. That's where his body had been, and those were his cousins grieving for him. 
So in this moment, again, it was not about all the drama, but for me it was about the grief, the universal connection of feeling. So even though I was doing photojournalist work, which means you, you pretty much you're flying and you can't always get the depth of it, but you can find moments to connect. And whilst the, they had laid his body out on the kitchen table and embalmed him there in front of us and then put him in the coffin, that was a young fellow. Normally you would, f you know, I'm very cautious about being intrusive and in invading on people's grief, but people wanted the international media. They want you to be there because they know that by being there there's some hope of change, which of course I mean, ultimately did happen. So, while I was jumping in and out doing these sort of stories for The Australian and for News Limited in general, we did spend time going out to Aboriginal communities. And I had been, I travelled with journalist Nicholas Rothwell and we'd been to different communities. And while I found them interesting, I didn't feel a great pull to do anything with them. Then one day we got a phone call and it was from... Uh, Newcrest Mind uh, up in, in Telfer, which was 1,600 kilometres north of Perth, saying, we've got some young Aboriginal boys that are going to play football in Perth for the first time. They've never left the desert. They're going to come and play. We're sponsoring them. We're play uh, we've got some people who are coaching them. Do you want to fly up? News you and a, a, a photographer and a, a journalist fly up for two hours. It's good PR for the mining company. And it was a free trip for News Limited, so they were very happy with something free. So we flew up there and we spent two hours on the ground with these young men. And I don't know what the, it was just an instant feeling for me. It's like I knew them. I felt like so familiar. And I felt like it, it just, the penny dropped. We always report when we're in the media, we don't have the luxury of time. We report very superficially because we drop in and we drop out. And I saw the interaction between the young men and the coaches, the non-Indigenous and Indigenous coaches that were with them and this real caring and the humanity and the different side of it. And I thought, this needs to be a documentary. It needs to be sh told the story from the inside out instead of the outside in. So when the boys came down to Perth, I hung out with them for a bit, got to know their elders... Um, and then over a two-year period, every time uh, I'd save up my loo days and I would drive, you know, f um, spend five days up to drive 1,600 kilometres, two-day two drive, spend it up in the desert with the, with the, uh, uh, with the elders and with the, the, at the football carnivals photographing them. Then I realised that um, if I wanted to do the story justice and I had to do it properly. I could not have my foot in one camp and a foot in the other camp, and the foot in the safety camp was having a full-time job. The unsafe was taking a massive risk, leaving the job and going to live with the mob full-time. And um, again, I had another boyfriend. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what do I do here? Always make a decision on the gut feeling. Spent three days, so one day, sitting on the floor of the living room, going, "Yeah, I've got to go. I've got to do it. This is so important because I'd been going back and forth for two years. I've got to do this." I'd get off the floor, walk into the kitchen, make a cup of tea, and my head would say, "Don't be so stupid. How are you going to survive? What are you going to do?" And I had not good health. I had chronic fatigue. I was pretty exhausted. And I thought, well, if I do it for six months. I just do it on willpower, I do it for six months, then I can have, I can afford, I can do this for 12 months, I can have afford for, six, do it for six months and then have the next six months as a rest and put the book together. Yeah, yeah, that'll do it. You sit back down on the floor and go, no, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. No, no, I can't. Three days. In the end, I just thought, get out of the head. Don't listen to what the fears in the head say. Listen to what the gut says. So I listened to what the gut said and I went in and resigned from work. And New, Zealand, News Limited said, uh, 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 was the boss and he was, had a bit of a stutter in Sydney and he said, what, 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 what have we done wrong? <laughs> do you want New York? Where do you want to go? 
I said, no, I'm going to the desert. Well, 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 you, well you can't leave. Oh, yeah, I will. So I did. And I did leave the boyfriend behind. And I went up to the desert. And when I got there, I had to go through the process again. I had meetings with the elders to make sure they understood what I was doing. And that was the beginning of the story of conversations with the mob. So when I was walking around on the first week with a camera in my, over my shoulder and I was shooting at that stage, I had made a decision. A lot of people were doing assignments shooting black and white and that day we didn't have the digital. So this was back in... I started... I first met the mob in 2000. I started the project in the July 2002. I had to make a decision. Do I shoot this on film? Well, I, no, sorry, I didn't have to make a decision because it was only film, really, the option. I had to make a decision, black and white or colour. And I decided to go with colour because the colour is so much part of the story. We don't, if it's black and white, we'll lose it. So I decided on colour. I was walking around the first week feeling pretty, like a bit like a fish out of water, walking around, and only white fella in a black fella community, carrying cameras. The women's come out and um, come out, go hunting with us. Took them out the back of the community and I just about fell over and thought, oh my God, this is just the weirdest feeling. This is all the landscape that I drew and used the do with the oil pastels when I was 16. And when we drove back into the community, one of the old women was sitting there and she said, hey, hey Wandy, Wandy, man and girl, you come over here. And I uh, sat down and she says, you're a funny looking thing walking around with those cameras. She said, but you know that country out there, that's your country. You've come from here. I know, I sort of felt connected. So it was, it took a long time. It took six months of being in the community. Even though I had made all those contacts, I had started to fit in and there's a reason that I got a deeper connection. But it still took six months before I took a photo that I believed mattered. And that was something of showing somebody inside the house. Because even though the mob live the way they do, and it's very, and for, for our perspective, it's probably quite messy, quite unclean, they are not unhappy about the way they live. To them, living in a house like that is normal. What they're more aware of is our judgment of them. So for me to take a photo like that, they're feeling that the outside world is going to judge. And Celia here is, was only 20 at the time. She was four months pregnant and she was um, breastfeeding her four-year-old daughter. She said, well, I don't care. This is the way I am. So it started for that shot, was the first real one. Now, when I, when my, when I, when my theory of being there for six months and leaving, the reason I think it took me that long to get something that was meaningful was because if I had left at six months, I would have thought I'd known something and I, I would have known nothing. It was only when I realised I knew nothing that I started to learn something. But in order to get the connection with them, I had... I, when I first went out there, I thought, I have an ability. I know they have the same ability in their culture, but I'll keep it quiet because I'm a documentary photographer and, and I'm not going to bring myself into the story. And while I was at Reuters, I had kept... I had to, and the media always had to keep the other side of myself quiet. But, and I also knew in their culture it was very much a man's domain. So when I was there, I thought, you know, just keep your stuff to yourself. Then one night we were out and one of the women, I'd only been there a couple, about three months, one of the women had a really bad asthma attack and we couldn't help her, there wasn't, couldn't get her to help. So I said, well, I have this ability, I, it. I can do energy healing and they call it Marvin. Do you want me to help you? So I helped her. And her breathing became quite normal very quickly. The next day, I was, we'd gone, I was standing in the community store and the mob were all looking at me. And then Nancy was the one I'd helped. She said, you ought to come here, walk, I want to see you. And I'm like, oh no, my heart's pounding. That's it, I'm out of here. I've crossed the, crossed the line. Walker was the main Marvin man, the main healer, and he's a beautiful man, but he wouldn't speak to anyone if he thought you were a waste of time. And he didn't speak a lot of English. She said, Walker wants to see you. So I went down to see Walker, and, I, and then I got told off for, why didn't you tell us you had this ability? 
We need someone else like you who can do this. And I got a headache and she's got a sore arm and da, da, da. can you help? <laughs> I say, I did. But after a, a couple of months after that, so I thought I was connected on, on, on a much deeper level again. But then after, three mo- uh, after a couple of months after that, or a month after that, two men went out into the desert to go hunting and they didn't return. And it was a bit like a... Old, a bit like a picnic at Hanging Rock. And I thought, well, we need to cover this story because it shows that blackfellas, when they go to country that's not their own, they can get lost. So they had the SES, the army, the police all searching for them. They gave up after a couple of days because it was up to 60 degrees between the sand hills. The mob had set out trackers. After a few days, they found the old boy and he had passed away and he's under a tree. They'd been going for another week and a half and they couldn't find the other fella and they still had a feeling that he might be alive. And I was way back in the other community, five hours away, and I said, look, I can come and help. Walker's saying, you know, Megan, should we should bring... The old boys are saying, no, bring Megan along. And, um, and they were saying, nah, nah, one of the younger fellas, nah, we don't need a white fella here. We don't need that. And in the end, the men just... The older boys said, nah, she's coming. He got me there. And the next day... We were out going out in a, in a, uh, a line of, of troop carriers, going very slowly because the, we went through the rabbit-proof fence and then way out in the desert, and then there was just nothing. <coughs> and um, I started to feel, it's like water divining. I could start to feel an energy, and I could feel that I knew where this person's body was. Walker had got out of the vehicle and walked back to one I was in. He said, you, you know, it was no words, but he said, you know, you know what you're thinking. And I said, yes. So within an hour, I had found where his body was. And I just picked it up. It's just like water divining. It's not super magic, but it's just just picking up stuff. From that moment on, I became... I stopped being a white fella and became a person. Just seeing me differently. So the doors opened. And from there, I could connect to people on a much different level because they didn't think I was judging, it was more I could understand. So the photos that you see, and this is Walker, and he's, this is him doing the marbin. Normally they would never let anyone photograph that, because it's been shut down and kept secret because they feel the judgment from the outside and, the, and not believing in, in their abilities. And as Walker would say to me, I'm doctor too. He said, just white fellas don't understand and they don't respect that I have the same training but in a different way. So, my photos, I'm not a brilliant photographer. I've got an eye for composition, but really what I was photographing was my connection to people. So I stopped seeing from the outside and I just looked straight into the inner person but I made sure I covered all aspects of community life. <laughs> and that baby, which they call a little fat lungi, which is a witchery, witchery grub, <laughs> <laughs> and they come along and you oh, grab the women, we'd grab the rolls and tug at them, and they thought it was a very good baby because in the old times, in the traditional times, if you had a fat baby like that, it means it would more likely survive. So the other thing, when I first got to the community, the mob said, there's one thing you'll never photograph here one day, and that's our sorry times and our funerals. That's not for white fellas. So after six months of being there, there was nearly one death a week And in one week, we had three deaths. And one family had lost four family members in two years, six family members in four years. And there was tremendous grief. And I could see that people... There was no time to recover from each death. And the young people would go to town and get drunk, make a nuisance of themselves, and white fathers say, you know, the bloody hell are they in here making a mess and da-da-da. But they didn't see that there was an emotional charge behind it. So I said to the elders, I need to photograph the funeral because 
if people from the outside can't understand what you're feeling on the inside, how is there ever going to be empathy? How is there ever going to be a communication and an understanding? And they thought about that for a while, and they said, you're right, you can do it. So this was a funeral of a father and son. The son was only 28, and the father was in his 50s. And these communities are dry communities. That's why they had to go to town to get the alcohol. And they're still very strongly traditional. So they normally would not have a name of a person on the cross. It's um, because when someone passes away, you move out of the house, you don't, put their, you don't use their name. And the grieving family members would, the immediate family members would shave their heads so that for the other people to understand that they had lost somebody and also so that the spirits of the past person wouldn't recognise them the same and not bother them. So this is Daylight and he's passed away now too but he was one of the real senior men and he had just buried his 17-year-old son who had, commi who had committed suicide um, and he was feeling an absolute failure that he hadn't recognised the signs in his son. He hadn't recognised the influences of this modern day life. And he was slumped in grief and it was the same. Everyone had been there for the funeral and then they'd driven out. And so he was feeling that sense of when, there's a sense of distraction when all the funeral business is going on and now he was alone with his feelings. And his little grandson came and shook him on the knee and said, Granddad, and sort of started to help bring him out of this. So when we did have the news of this funeral, uh, of this death, the day the news came in, I walked out to the community to see Daylight and his wife, Namaru, the young fellow who, mother of the young fellow who died. Namaru was on her knees with a skirt on, topless, painted in red ochre. She was had her head thrown back, wailing and screaming, and daylight was curled up in the earth beside her in a fetal position. And my mind thought, God, this is an incredible picture. But I can't take, and for a moment, I, thought, I can't take this picture, because if I take this one picture, then all my work is gone, because it would break the trust of that absolute moment. Um, so I made a decision not to do it. But when I won a Walkley with this work, one of the National Geographic editors who had, had just um, finished being the editor and a new one had come on, he said, you've got to send this work, this has got to be in National Geographic. Sent, and um, I'll tell the editor it's got to be in. So I got a, sent the work, got a letter from the new editor saying, oh yeah, the stuff's all right, but because um, he had read that I'd written the story. Sometimes I, I put that describe that scene in words, I didn't take the picture. And he'd read that and he said, well, you know, you need to take some more demonstrative work. You know, this is, there's nothing going on in these shots. And I thought if he can't see it and he hasn't had any concept of an Aboriginal community, there's no point. But footy's everything and it's uh, fiercely competitive. Yeah, if one team is, sometimes the people on the timer will go over time to give the other team a chance. <laughs> um, I once was on the timer, which was very scary. There were, was a Juna stick thrown and a boomerang if things got pretty heated. <laughs> uh, the phone booth in the community, centre of, center of all gossip. Gossip is just key. Who is sleeping with who? And who might sleep with who? Now this little fellow was only about two years of age. And we'd been out hunting. The, the blue ash is, was the spin effect, so they set fire to the spin effect so that you can see the tracks of the animals. And this little fellow was mucking around with a termite mound and then after a bit his family was like, why is he taking so long? Come on, come on. And he pulled out a fat little witchy grub and stuffed it in his mouth. How he knew it was in there, don't know. Here, <laughs> the old girl, she, this is a goanna hole, and she got right down in it, and she pulled out this big goanna, 
held up the uh, crowbar, swung it round and smacked its head on the crowbar and it was all over and that was a feed. Well, later when she saw this picture, she hit me. Why did you take that picture? <laughs> She's laughing. There, an old girl, she's in her 70s digging. So when I was out there, I shooting this on film. It was up to 60 degrees heat. I was sleeping in the back of my car, sleeping on the ground, sleeping on the floor. Never knew where I'd be from one day to the next. I did not have a bed. Um, and I lived in the car for six years, pretty much, or on the ground, wherever. Um, but I included the young fella, the people in the processing of this. So it's a, a partially cooked emu that they got out hunting and they were taking it back to share back in the camp. So I got the, I'd struck up a deal with the, photo, with the pharmacy in town. I mean, they just did the normal processing of negs, nothing special. I'd take the rolls of negatives in every month and get them processed. And um, then take the negatives out. I had a scanner and a laptop and I'd get the mob to come through with me and particularly young fellows when, after their football and they'd, they'd help edit the pictures so they knew the whole process. They felt very involved in it. These are two young children, Sebastian and Chantel. Little did I know that you'll see a photo of them a bit older, that they eventually came to live with me for a while. If there's any questions, you can ask me a question and stick your hand up if, I, if, if there's anything you want to know about anything in particular. So this was a dream time place uh, in the middle of the desert, a bit of an oasis, a bit of a, a spring. It's where they'd say a quiet, a um, good, spirit, good snake lives there. So if you asked him permission, you could, you could go and play around there. Oops, have I gone backwards? Oops, sorry, might have doubled up. So the mob are very fashion conscious. If one person gets a tent, everyone else has to have a tent. So this was the tent year. Someone arrived with a tent, and if you put a TV in, it was even better. <laughs> they didn't last long. But the bad side of the life, and that's a hard thing to deal with. There's a lot of n neglect with the, animal, with the dogs, and the mob would go out of town and go away for three weeks and leave their dogs. In this case, the dogs were starving, and um, one of the white fellows that was out there got very distressed about it, so he went and shot a camel and dragged it into the camp. The dogs were happy. This is Jennifer and Angus. They very much love their dog, but a white fellow out there who was doing the building thought it would be really funny to paint their room red. And the mob said to me, what's wrong with him? Was he like that colour for? <laughs> oh, and Jennifer and Angus, they're still very much in touch. They rang me a couple of months ago and they said, Wendy, you missing us? So I said, yeah, of course I'm missing you. You haven't been back for a while? No. You know it's our 50th birthday in a couple of months, yeah. Well, how are you going to feel? We lived a long time and we're nearly 50. And, and how are you going to feel if, if something happened to us and you didn't see us before, before you got back here? How are you going to feel? <laughs> yep. Sad. This is a salt lake. No windscreen. So we're along, uh, sorry, Bangor community just before the storm hit. So there's a hundred more stories I could tell you. What time are we going on? But so the next one, when my book had come out in 2008, I felt very strongly that the whole time I'd been out there, the diet was really bad. And I did spend probably 20% of my time doing the book. Sometimes I would only take one picture a month because I'd have the camera there all the time. And, um, but it, there wasn't always opportunities for photos, but I always had it there. But I ended up spending a lot of time looking after people with their health, being very concerned about the whole diet and realising that most of the health problems were coming from an emotional discord and from diet. 
So when the book came out, I, the old people from Wurrulong community, which is a community that they're related to the Madu, and they're about six hours drive, but just on the periphery of the desert, Wurrulong was a community that I had been there and I promised myself I'd never go back because the mob went there, said, oh, this is typical of the blackfellas. I wonder if we go in there for a funeral. We just, we just go in for a couple of days. Ten days later, and 45 degrees heat, we're still camping on the oval. And the dust, and I thought there was no shelter there. It was so rough. But after I'd put the book out, some of my good friends, Clary, one of my really close friends, Clary, who actually reminds me, I didn't finish that story about my dream. So as I said way back then, when I was 16, I had the dream. When I went to live with the Mardu, when I was sitting at the riverbed one night, he said, one like, tall black fella said to me, you know that fella in that dream? He said, that was me. So when I got to... Clary had gone to Warralong, and he said, the old people were asking that you come and do what you've been doing out with the other mob. And we're worried about the, the health of the children. In this community, there were 60 to 70 children with only about seven carers, and most of those were elderly. All the services are bypassing them, and a lot of the mob had bypassed them because they were considered the most dysfunctional. So a couple of months after the book came out, I thought, right, well, I'll go back up there. The principal was new. She didn't know anything about the culture. So she said, well, do you want to help us out? And I said, yeah, and I'll help you. And I said, but there's no point trying to teach these children if you don't change their diet because they're so high on sugar and junk food the teachers couldn't control them. So I set up a healthy eating program, and it was just more common sense. Um, we, we only had the opportunity to feed them dinner, uh, sorry, breakfast and lunch, uh, breakfast and morning tea, and after that they went home for their own lunch, which mostly they didn't eat, um, and then they came back for school in the afternoon. So the principal said, can you, uh, can you cook? I went, oh, yep. No, not really, but I can. <laughs> the night before, I worked out a, a, a um, recipes. So we pretty much got them off all the sugar, off all, uh, mostly dairy except goat cheese. Got them off a lot of wheat, changed, substitute that. Made breakfast into dinner, knowing that they had to have, that was the only main meal that we could control and morning tea into lunch. So we were making polenta pizzas. They had fruit juice. In the afternoon, I had got you know, frozen mango, frozen honeydew, and made natural ice creams for them. So if they came back to school in the afternoon, because they'd quite frequently disappear, then they got an ice cream. So the attendance improved enormously. So within two weeks, the mucus in the nose and the ears had started to clear up. After five weeks, the teachers said, can't believe it, we can teach them. They're not cli literally climbing the walls. Then a bloke came in to the community, who the mob thought was very dodgy, came in to sell the children a very, very um, highly priced soft drink. The children all rushed out after five weeks of being on good food, rushed out and bought all the soft drink, and the next day they couldn't control them, the teachers were going mad, they said, that's it, sugar's banned. So this was back in 2008 before it became a popular thing. Um, so from there, from there, the healthy eating program has been going since 2008 till now, and these children are now considered the most healthiest and most functioning children in the desert, having gone from the most dysfunctional. And I sat in the class and the school uh, with them and helped them on an emotional level because with my abilities, and also I had trained, which I didn't mention in my early 20s, as a subconscious mind therapist. So I worked, we worked with all the children. The older ones now are, are looking after the younger ones and doing it in a much healthier way. Um, then I went back, I do that for three months every year, and then I go back and Fuji very kindly sponsored cameras, so the children started doing their own little photo workshops and, and f doing, uh, photographing their food. So they were, in this shot, they're learning food photography. So 
when I had finished Conversations with the Mob, really, I, I was so exhausted, I didn't even want to pick up a camera, and I didn't want a heavy camera. I didn't want a camera that was a big digital brick, and I kept visualising, why can't someone bring out a little camera that's like a digital, but it's like film? And there was nothing. Nikon didn't have anything. And then in 2012, Fuji approached me and said, we've got this camera that's, uh, that's little, but got big files. It was the X-Pro X -Pro 1. And it was exactly along the lines of what I was thinking, because up until that point, I didn't feel like taking many pictures. So I started taking pictures again. And I also did music videos out there, and I sort of was giving back in a way, but then starting to find a way to enjoy photography again, because I was pretty burnt out. Um, in four years ago, Fuji asked me to, the X-T1 camera had come out, and they said, can you go and do something with the camera? We want to film you doing it. And I thought, well, I can't just go and be fake. I need to do a real story. So what had bothered me for six years was the children that you had seen in the shot where there was the rifle and the two little children, Sebastian and Chantal, had come into my care when they were four and five briefly because their mother had had a psychotic episode. Uh, and she had mental health issues. And I had, they had gone to their grandfather and then eventually back to their mother. I had spent months looking after their mother in the hospital. So whilst being a photographer, you're so in the community, you can't just take pictures and step away. You become so much part of the community. So I did a lot of caring. And then in 2014, I think it was, the children, or 13 children, I got a phone call to do, with Fuji to do this video. So I did it out in the desert, out at uh, the central desert where these children had moved. I'd lost touch for six years. I couldn't find them. Made contact, and there is a video online where I'm using the camera, but my real motivation was to go and find these children, which I did. And after two weeks of getting back, and I thought, you know, they're doing okay, I got a phone call from the family begging me, said a uh, tip-off that social welfare was about to take them because Catherine had their mother had lost the plot again, and could I take them? And I went, oh no, I'm a broke photographer with two dogs, and now I have two children. <laughs> what do I do? So I'd find somewhere to live. I used my visualised that some lovely real estate would say, it's all right, we don't need to see your paperwork. You can come. And, and I rented a house. And a friend chipped in and lent me some money, and, and I did as much work as I could within the round. I couldn't go away and do assignments, obviously, because I had the children in school. So during that time, I thought, well, what can I do? And I had moved up to the Central Coast. So I'd gone Western Australia, back to Sydney to the Central Coast. And in this time, my father had had strokes. And, and I was 20 minutes down the road for him, so it was actually good for my parents because I could spend time looking after him while I was looking after the children. Um, so I thought, my I was watching my father go into decline and then improve a bit, and he'd had all the alternative therapy, he had no choice being in my family, and he's an Irishman that lived on chops and spuds all his life, and he's a farmer. Um, and his name is Austin. So I thought, well, sometimes the, the, the most strong stories and some of the most valuable ones are the ones that are right and close, close to us. They don't always have to be out and away. So I said to my father, Austin, Dad, do you mind if I photograph your story? And because he'd been going through such a rough time, he said, well, well, why would you want to photograph me? I said, because I'm really admiring that you're working so hard on yourself. And he says, but, I, but I'm nothing. And I said, no, you're everything everything to me, and, and I think your story could help other people. So he's a fit, all his life he's very strong, very fit. I thought he was a bit of a ladies' man when he was younger. I thought he was pretty hot. Then at, at 80, at, at 79, he had one stroke. He'd made, to made a really good recovery, and then he'd had an angiogram and had two more. And he'd gone into decline. He'd lost control of his of his bladder and, and, and the rest. And he had to suddenly wear pull-ups. And he'd gone from a fit, strong man 
to someone who was struggling. But even though he was struggling, mum made him get in the kitchen. He says, you've got to do something. So he then, he, he did have depression. And then we got him, he was having, got him having acupuncture. He had healings. He had a whole range of alternative therapy and he started to really improve, but he was still feeling very physically weak. So, I mean, I just documented him just doing his little, having his treatments. And every time he felt sorry for himself, mum and I would wind him up, make him laugh. So at 80, Dad took up yoga. Pretty big for an Irishman. Very gentle. He had a very good teacher. And Mum had ch changed his diet and he went to have a test on his heart. He'd been told his heart was deteriorating so much six months before this. He was going in to see what results he was up to. And the cardiologist, well-known cardiologist, Ross Walker, said to him, I don't, in this shot, he was saying to him, I don't know what you've been doing. He said, but whatever you do, you keep it up because your heart's improving. He was, mum was so delighted. <laughs> So he had a moment of feeling sorry for himself. <laughs> he wasn't allowed. So he loved walking. So I said, Dad, how am I going for time, Ray? One minute? Good, nearly there. So I said, Dad, I want to do some, a bit more of an intimate portrait of you. He says, well, well what do you want to do? And I said, well, you're having to wear the pull-ups and it's something that we have so secret men don't talk about. Women get used to these. Women, it's not such a shock for women because they've had to deal with periods and childbirth and all that. But for men, when they've been having good physical health all their time or haven't noticed that they haven't, but they're still strong, it's a hard thing to take. And I said, there's a lot of men out there, Dad, that are struggling. Are you OK to show that you're OK with it? He says, oh, yes, I guess so. So he was getting ready for his portrait. So and that's it. Thank you.